freshman FYEP student, please uh, sign up with a red sign a red sheet on the way out. Red raffle ticket. What do they get if they? Twenty dollar reward card. So. And extra credit, probably. Probably no guarantees on extra credit. <laughs> so I'd like to thank Student Activities uh, for generously supporting this reading series. I'd also like to thank the, the Canton College Foundation for again for their, their generous contributions, as well as the support of the Humanities Department and the School of Business and Liberal Arts. There's been a lot of folks who have helped make this happen, and uh, I don't have time to thank all of them, but you know who you are, so thank you. Tonight's reader, Siobhan Fallon, is the author of You Know When the Men Are Gone, which was listed as a best book of 2011 by the San Francisco Chronicle, Self Magazine, Los Angeles Public Library, Janet Maislin of the New York Times, and it also won the 2012 Indies Choice Honor Award the Texas Institute of Letters Award for First Fiction, and the 2012 Penn Center USA Literary Award in Fiction. That's a big one, last one. Her collection of stories about the families of Fort Hood, Texas, during an Army Brigade's deployment to Iraq has been called The Explosive Sort of Literary Triumph That Appears Only Every Few Years by New York Journal of Books. A terrific and terrifically illuminating book by the Washington Post, Searing Collection by Entertainment Weekly and Fascinating by O, the Oprah Magazine. Theatrical productions of her stories include performances by Word for Word in San Francisco and stories on stage in Denver. More of Siobhan's work has appeared in Women's Day, Good Housekeeping, New Letters, Publishers Weekly, NPR's Morning Edition, Huffington Post, <coughs> and she also writes fiction, a fiction series for Military Spouse Magazine. Siobhan has an also has an MFA from the New School of New York City. It's been a great uh, pleasure to get to know Siobhan and her visit here for, to SUNY Canton. While in the North Country, she's also done events at uh, Jefferson County Community College. And yesterday we did a live broadcast from Fort Drum, which was very exciting. Uh, great to be on stage and be able to interact with Siobhan <coughs> on the air. A little stressful, a little more stressful even than this being sitting in front of a crowd about this big and then knowing that you're being broadcast out to the, the North Country. Um, but a good time. And it's been, what really struck me when we were doing the event on Fort Drum was there was actually a general in the audience, which um, I never knew how intimidating that would be until Siobhan leaned over at Elbow Games, like, that guy's a general. And, uh, and it was, it was an, one of those things that I don't know how often, I, I don't think I've ever been in the room. When he got up, he, he, uh, he made a comment, and he said to, to Ms. Fallon, he's, he had a lot of comments, but one of the things that he said was uh, he thanked her for her service. And um, his comments, along with Ms. Fallon's book, has, has reminded me um, that it's not only the soldier that serves. It's the families, it's the loved ones, it's the kids, it's everyone that's left behind as well. And he also said that when the soldier deploys, the family has a deployment of their own. And that really, uh, really stuck with me. Um, after last night, I went home, and this morning I woke up and I was getting my son out of bed. He's 11 months old. And it struck me. I remember I just, I looked at him and I thought, what would it be like to leave him for a year right now? And uh, it really put me back. This whole experience of reading this Valens book and bringing her here has really made me think about these experiences that she's shed light upon in her book and, and what, what we ask of our young men and women to serve. And, uh, and I hope for all of you who, who have read the book, you've had a similar experience that has caused you to reflect upon this uh, and maybe share a little gratitude. So please. I'm happy with that. Let's, uh, let's welcome Siobhan Fallon and thank you for her service.
what we call upstate New York, which is five and a half hours south of you. So <laughs> this is need to be up here. It looks similar to where I grew up, but very different. So I'm going to go home and call all my friends say that we're from the city now, but it seems like it's really like to be up here. Um, so I'll just give a little background, if I may, about where I was when I started writing the story. Um, and can you guys hear me back there? Okay, good. So just start waving wildly if you can. I have a tendency to mumble and get distracted. So. And I'm little, so I'm thinking I need to be on my tippy toes for this mic. But am I all right? Yeah? Okay. Um, so my husband is still active duty right now in the United States Army. and. Uh, we were stationed at Fort Hood in 2006. And uh, for those of you who are older, um, that was during the Petraeus Surge. And it's a time in uh, Army history where soldiers were deploying from anywhere from 12 months to 16 months to Iraq and Afghanistan. And they were really lucky if they were home for a year before they were deploying again. So we arrived at Fort Hood and we were there maybe two weeks. We had to hardly unpack a thing when my husband learned that he was deploying to Iraq and left for a year. And when he got back, um, almost as soon as he was home, he realized that he, he was gearing up. You know, his uh, time was going to deploy again in about a year. So there was sort of this prevalent awareness at all times that even if your soldier was home with you, he wasn't going to be home for long. And it was the same with all of my friends. And um, Sort of a very, you're very saturated with this idea of soldiers being away. Everyone had bumper stickers that said, Half my heart's in Iraq or Afghanistan, and huge signs. Those of you who probably drive through Fort Drum or near Fort Drum to get it, I saw the same thing when I was there yesterday. The big billboards that said, You know, go Tenth Mountain and come home safe and all that sort of thing. And actually, Fort Hood is sort of still on that kind of timeline. So if you're familiar with that area, that's kind of where I was at Fort Hood, Texas, when I was writing the stories. And uh, my husband was a company commander, and he was in charge of 160-man infantry unit. And kind of by default, I was the main contact for all of those family members. So like moms, dads, spouses, godparents, whoever wanted to get information on their soldier would call or email me. And uh, it's a volunteer job, but before my husband and I got married, he had said to me, I'm only married to a woman who will be a family readiness group leader. So I knew that was in my future. And it says a lot about my spouse's future to get involved in this family readiness group. And it's <coughs> sort of your life in that kind of job. But um, while I was in that position, I suddenly had more insight into the everyday life of sort of the entire Army family community in a way that I hadn't just as a spouse. Even though I'd been married and I knew everything about the Army, it wasn't until I was um, sort of in constant dialogue with these families who were going through a lot of crazy stuff that I really had a sense of what was happening on every level. Like we had a 16-year-old wife or spouse. Um, we had a sergeant's wife who was diagnosed with cancer. We're just all of this stuff was happening while soldiers were getting ready to deploy over 7,000 miles away. So, kind of this feeling of anxiety all the time. Um, and I had a family call me as soon as they had learned that their soldier was at the Baghdad ER. I was the first person the mother talked to besides the uh, chaplain who had been given them the news. So, all of these things were kind of floating around my head when I started writing the story. And they are fiction, absolutely fiction. Please don't think that I behave like some of these characters. <laughs> but uh, there's always a moment in a story that I kind of gleaned <coughs> from real life. And uh, this particular excerpt that I'm reading from today, it's uh, from Camp Liberty. And the story is about a sergeant, Sergeant Moog, who is in the army and he's counting down the day until he kind of like a split for soldiers. They were always had calendars and they were saying, oh, I got 119 days, I'm getting out, I'm going to make some money, I'm going to be in the real world again. And um, we knew a bunch 
who get back. I don't know, friends of yours who are soldiers, if you ask them about their interpreters, they're probably going to have some really neat stories because that's their link between their communities in Iraq and Afghanistan and they depend on that entirely. I mean, soldiers aren't speaking Pashtun or Arabic and they have really very little sense of what's going on without their interpreters and they have these incredible relationships. And my husband is still friends with interpreters he had back in 2004 in Afghanistan, and of course we're on Facebook now, which is, it blows my mind, but um, there's a lot of the just communication, soldiers sort of worry about the Turks that they left behind in very dangerous places, and not knowing how they're seen by their fellow Iraqis or Afghanis who think they're collaborators. So, okay, um, I think I've set up the story enough. I'm just going to start reading, and I'm kind of lifting a, a section from the center of the story. And I'm also didn't really think about it very well. There's a bunch of accents that I'm not even going to try to do, so forgive me. So it's Camp Liberty. Their first mission with Renin was an easy one. There was a new girls' school on the outskirts of Dora. The headmistress had written a letter to the base battalion commander asking for school supplies and a generator. Sergeant Moog and his men had a few boxes of pencils and crayons, spiral notebooks and soccer balls, a case of water bottles, six cans of peanut butter, salting crackers, and apples stolen from the mess hall. If a school was overtly asking for aid, for aid from the Americans, it had to be in desperate need. Hey, sister, one of the men shouted from the back of the truck. Moog looked down the line, catching specialist Brodus DuPont, elbowing specialist Crawford. Welcome to the boom boom room, DuPont continued. Trapped laughter hissed from behind the hands of the soldiers next to him. That's boom doom du boom boom DuPont, Moe said to Renin. He survived three IEDs, two of them in this very same Humvee. Moe tapped the soft wall for emphasis. He's first platoon's very own living, living, breathing lucky charm. The soldiers high fived and then DuPont, never one to let the attention of a lady pass him by called out again. Hey, maybe you can settle something we've been debating since we got to this upstanding country. He hesitated theatrically. Do you all eat pork? Cut it out, Moog said. DuPont was a good soldier and a bright kid. Had been a third string tight end at LSU until he ran out of money, and he called his mama in Baton Rouge once a week. Mo suspected he also had some serious PTSD. But he was the kind of guy who had a difficult time staying out of trouble back home when there wasn't a sergeant looking over his shoulder all the time. What, Sarge? I'm just trying to broaden our Muslim cultural awareness. Everybody wants to know if a Muslim can eat hot dog, but nobody asks. Has she ever had the distinct pleasure of biting into a plump, dirty water dog on a hot summer day? Or maybe a spicy, thick hunk of good old Louisiana, Louisiana Andrew Lee sausage? This is something we are very eager to know. All the soldiers were laughing now, heads lowered into the stiff padding of their Kevlar vests, their rifles knocking into their helmets, leaning into one another and shaking their heads. Renine had been looking out the window, but now she slowly turned and directed her gaze at DuPont. She didn't say anything, just stared, and the laughter dried up, the men glancing away until even DuPont lost his grin, finally shrugged, and bent over to tie the already perfectly tied lace of his boot. Moog rubbed his chin against his shoulder to hide a smile. So this chick might be okay, he thought. Renine went back to looking out the dust-battered window, her face emotionless. 
Two of the Humvees pulled security around the school, guns out, creating a half moon of camouflage against the dilapidated building. It had been hit by a mortar to the left of the entrance. The concrete still crumbled and loose, but someone had stuck fake flowers in the rubble, and it looked almost different. A tall woman in a headscarf stood in the doorway, wringing her hands, glancing around at the Humvees and soldiers with their guns, looking at the blank windows of the building surrounding the school. The woman spoke to Renine, and Renine nodded, then whispered to Moe, she says so many soldiers will bring unwelcome attention. Moe glanced around, noticing how quiet the streets were. This is a dangerous neighborhood, ma'am, but we'll be out of here in a few minutes. Dupont, Dupont, covered in a sheen of sweat and grimacing, carried tree box stacked on top of one another. Moe had tasked him with the job of handing out school supplies to help his quest for Muslim cultural awareness. There were no desks in the classroom, and the only light came from the windows and the holes in the ceiling left behind by a mortar attack. About 20 young girls in tattered but brightly colored dresses were sitting on the floor, eyes wide, hands folded in their laps. DuPont dropped the boxes, pulled out his knife, and slit them open, the cardboard admitting a low scream. When he started handing out the notebooks, the Crayola crayons, and the, the girls could sit no longer and got to their feet like skittish does, hiding behind one another, but pushing closer to DuPont and his magic boxes, their hands reaching out thin and spindly for his gifts. After securing a book and a pencil or crayon, the children ran into the corners of the room and flopped back down on the ground, opening up to fresh pages of paper and writing on them, tiny letters or shapes so as not to take up too much room to make that paper last. Do you mind giving us a tour? Moog asked the headmistress, and the lines of her face were softer now, her hands patting the heads of the children. Renine translated, and the woman nodded and led the way. There were two other rooms. One had stacks of thin blankets folded against the wall, the other small wooden cupboards and rusty sink that clearly had not produced water in a long while. He was glad they had managed to bring the peanut butter and apple. And before he left, he would have the men open up their MRE and hand out the food to the kids. He'd only seen a small cracked blackboard, but no books. And he looked at the headmistress again, wondering if she was the only teacher. Renine and the woman spoke in whispers, and Moe did not mind that she didn't translate. He trusted his Turks to know, to realize that they would tell him what he needed to know. He heard a shout from outside and ran to the window. The soldiers, their guns slung across their bulky Kevlar-shielded backs, had dumped out the box of soccer balls and were kicking them around, and the girls, barefoot and holding their long dresses up to their knees, started kicking them back. He sat in front of Renine on the, long, on the return ride to the base. She leaned forward and asked, will the battalion commander approve the generator? I'll write up a report. I'll even talk to the company commander myself. The little girls, they sleep there, she continued. Their parents have sent them from far away. The headmistress finds ways to feed them. She looked to see if anyone was listening, but the guys were intently looking out the window, the streets eerie and empty. Mo knew that it was just beginning to dawn on them that, while they had been kicking around soccer balls and drawing pictures of American screaming eagle in the little girl's notebook, Insurgents had had plenty of time to plant improvised explosive devices in every roadside pothole or pile of rubbish all the way back to the base. Renine continued, she told me there's a factory one half mile east. It is rumored to have foreigners working there. I assume it is where IEDs are perhaps created. Mo straightened his seat, it straightened in his seat. Are you kidding? How'd you get that information? Renine blinked at him. It's the information we are meant to get. Of course, that is why your battalion commander sent us to a girls' school so far away. Dora is a bad neighborhood. The mistress understands that in order to get a generator, she must have good information. You know that also. She turned her face away as if insulted by Moe's ignorance. Her voice continued, No one notices the women in this country, and therefore no one notices how much the women notice. Mo went home to New York for his two weeks of mid-tour leave. His parents had moved out of the city soon after 9-11.
to a house on the outskirts of Cold Spring, a small town north of Manhattan, near the Hudson River and commuter trains. His girlfriend, Marissa, came to visit, carrying a huge suitcase twice the size of Moe's duffel bag, wearing a short wool skirt and high-heeled boots. Her parents and Moe's had been friends for decades. They used to share a house together in the Hamptons in the summer, where Moe would make fun of Marissa's braces, until she cried, and now his parents had a guest room done up in lavender that they called Marissa's room. His mother sent them out for dinner, before dinner for wine and French bread. Moe drove his father's BMW too fast, his eyes everywhere, looking for abnormalities on the side of the road that might be hiding an IED, waiting for a truck to come careening into him. Marissa tried to laugh in the passenger seat, holding on to her seatbelt. The grocery store was overwhelming, the shelves high, so many colors, options, the lights too bright. Marissa slipped her arm through his and led him to the cereal aisle, primary colored boxes rising from floor to ceiling, accosting him with leering, cartoon characters and favors, flavors painted to look like they were exploding from bowls of milk. As they left the aisle, Mo heard a tall woman speaking to a young man in a red vest. How many times do I have to ask for organic, fresh O's? It's the only cereal my Ashley will eat. I have been shopping here faithfully for five years. Mo stopped and stared at the woman in the blue horn and glasses. He thought of the barefoot girl from Nora, and he suddenly wanted to punch this woman in the head. Daisy, Marissa called from the end of the aisle. The woman in the glasses had also stopped speaking and was watching Mo. Her plucked eyebrows lifted with annoyance and perhaps fear at the way he was standing too close. Mo turned and followed Marissa's boots to the cashier. He had a runny nose and he was tired all the time. He told his family it was jet lag and he tried to stay in bed even when he heard Marissa's voice outside his bedroom door each morning. His father asked him if he wanted to go to the city one day, to the dining district perhaps, and Moe kept coughed behind his hand. So they thought he was supposed to propose, which would explain why his parents kept sending him and Marissa out each night to a different restaurant and Marissa's red-rimmed eyes each morning when he had not. They'd only had sex twice during the last week when his parents were out golfing, and it had been fast and unsatisfying. Marissa stunned and silent on his child's bed when he was done. She was leaving in two days, home to Long Island, and her second grade class, and Mo was glad. He wanted to be back in Madrid. The platoon leader was new, and Mo worried about his men. He was a pain in the ass to find a different route back to base each day with the roads blocked off, covered in rubble, and he knew his men would get complacent. Would the young lieutenant remember to rearrange the order of the Humvee so the insurgents didn't know where the leadership was situated? Would the LT know to stay away from the corner of Yarmouk near the marketplace where IEDs seemed to go off no matter how many times they barricaded and searched the streets? What about that overpass on Route Tampa where Jay Shaw Medi dumped the bodies of the people they had tortured and killed? Did the lieutenant know that they had also started placing bombs under corpses, hoping to kill the American and Iraqi soldiers who gathered them up and brought them to the war? Everything at home annoyed him, and he knew it was irrational and misplaced, but did Marissa really need to watch extra every night to catch up on Jessica Simpson's latest breakup? Did one missing woman in Missouri, sure, she's pretty, a wife and a mother of three, really need to be the headlining story on every single news program when there were American soldiers, mothers and dads, wives and husbands dying in Iraq and Afghanistan? Why weren't Larry King and Barbara Walters interviewing their grieving families, telling their life stories? He tried. He really did. He tried to care when Marissa told him about his second graders with their video games and peanut allergy, or when his mother complained about gas prices, or when his father had a lousy day at home. Something was wrong with him. Some part of him was still keyed into Baghdad, into his Humvee, his night vision goggles, his men riding down streets and not knowing what was at the end of them. And everything that he thought would make him happy here at home suddenly seemed so inconsequential. He couldn't even go for a run anymore on old 9W, past that stone Episcopal church with his early 19th century cemetery, the governor's white house hidden by shade, 
down to the garrison train tracks to glimpse the bare mountain bridge sparkling over the water, that route that he always took when he visited his parents, because one of their neighbors, an obese 55-year-old banker in a Yankees cap, might be riding a mower, yes, riding a mower for a quarter of an acre plot of water sprinkled and poised technicolor green grass. Every time Mo saw that smug, fat face, he wanted to jump over the guy's white picket fence and beat the living shit out of him. He had to get back to Baghdad soon. Of course, when he did get back, he told everyone what they wanted to hear. That the food had never been better. Filet mignon and fried calamari that melted in his mouth. Beer so cold it stung his tongue. Gin tonic, single malt scotch, and screwing his girlfriend three times a day. His runny nose immediately dried up, and he felt alert again, awake at dawn to the call to prayer that reverberated around the base. It was as if his body had grown dependent on the 120 degree days and the 40 degree nights, the long sleeve camouflage uniform and the heavy lace up boots, the weight of the helmet and the 40 pound Kevlar vest, the tinny water fed into his mouth by a warm tube from the camelback slung over his shoulder that churned out and tasteless egg with chow hall in the morning, the dried out MREs in the afternoon, sleep deprived nights of helicopters landing on mortars, ringing with usual bad aim at the perimeter of the base. His body thrived in the desert, and Mo was seized with a terrible thought. What if, after all his longing to get out and get on with his life, in his comfortable middle age, he would look back at this time and realize that his years in the army were the most vivid, the most startlingly real of his entire life. Maybe he should not be getting out after all. Bernine smiled when she saw him, the first time he'd ever seen her teeth, small and white but crooked in front. Did I miss anything? He asked, squinting into the sun. The girls' school received generators, she replied. Moog had overheard the first sergeant and company commander bitching about the rangers and special forces guys coming in and taking over one of the high-value targets. And he wondered if maybe the Dora IED had been in. Good work, he said, and Renine blushed a high red over her sharp cheekbones. Moog had to look at the sun, letting it blind him for a moment so he wouldn't blush. You said you left Fort Hood in 2006. Mm -hmm. I got there in 2006. So you, were you there in 2000? Was, if memory serves me correct, was, didn't they have the shooting in 2009? Yes. Uh, were you there? In July, that would have to be November of just So you had friends there, obviously. I did. I was uh, in Monterey, in the base of Monterey, and I saw some like, lit up with everyone mm -hmm. calling me, thinking I was still at Fort Hood with a family writing this group leader mm -hmm. still. And I do, I have, I have two kids now. I had, um, when I started writing the short stories, I was pregnant with my oldest daughter, who's now five and a half. And um, when my husband deployed, she was five months old. And uh, so he missed a tremendous chunk of his son for a year. And he left and she wasn't following or doing anything for him. And then he came back and she was talking and like, already thinking out and um, valuing the slippers. Because we have an intimate now, and we've seen all these things, and he had been training a lot too while she was very young, so he was home very little. Um, 
he doesn't remember ever changing her diaper, which I'm sure he did in the same form, but just goes to show like, how much he was out of the house from her birth until she was you know, almost two. But uh, we had, like, technology has been a godsend. Like, we had diapers occasionally. He wasn't usually in a place where he could diaper, but every once in a while he would have some kind of green zone, and we'd Skype every day and see my daughter, so at least she hears her voice. And the USO does this incredible program where they will film a soldier reading a book on a DVD, and they, they go to different bases, the FOB in Iraq, and I'm, hoping, I'm sure they do in Afghanistan, and they would send the book and the DVD to the family at home. So you just open up this unbelievable package and you have this image of your soldier reading a great book. I can't stand the cat in the hat now because you heard it. <laughs> So like almost every day I would try and play it to my daughter so she could see him and know that he, you know, was not more than just a photo. So Yes. Where did you get your ideas for the stories that they didn't happen in real life? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. I meant to say that in my intro when I got nervous. Um <laughs> Like I said, I was a family readiness group leader and talking to a lot of family members a lot. Um, but of course my husband is a soldier and I think he's a great storyteller, so I, I pay really close attention. And we have a lot of barbecues and all of our friends at Fort Hood were military. So I kind of think of myself as a really good eavesdropper. And you get a bunch of soldiers hanging out, having a few drinks, and they're, they might not tell people outside their group, their war stories, but they will tell each other and like one up each other and just tell some really crazy tales. And I would gravitate towards those and like listen and not take physical notes, but I, I pay very close attention and make mental notes all the time. And um, and like I said, this particular story, we knew we knew four sergeants at Fort Hood who had all been had really lucrative jobs around the time of September 11th and then quit their jobs and join the military. So I kind of could see their shift like from civilian life to military life and how they claimed to miss civilian life so much, but they just had the most incredible moments in Iraq that were so real and vivid. And I, I wondered if they really did want to get out even though they said they did. And that was kind of the motivation for that particular story. Um, and my husband, when he was deployed, unfortunately he was deployed for most of the writing of this book, I would send him excerpts and he would read them and say, oh my God, Siobhan, what the hell is going on at home? But he would also <laughs> give me really great advice on what Iraq was like and sent photos and um, there's a story, and actually this at the end of the story, somebody's reading all the really foul graffiti in the men's latrine and I kept asking him and all his friends to send me from every bathroom in Iraq. And I, I couldn't even use any of the graffiti they sent. It was really funny, but it was just too foul for my book. And I'm not criticizing any of this book. But so I made something up, but I, I made it up after hearing so many great and obscene graffiti. Like I sort of took some of it and used it to inspire. So a lot of it was listening and then taking what I saw and just really building on it. Yes,
In general, I've had really great uh, reception from the military community. Um, I've been very lucky that I, I get a lot of emails and from Vietnam vets to you know war with gold star widows or this generation with spouses. Um, but every once in a while, I do get a very angry email mm -hmm. that says, um, "Why are you doing this? Why are you letting people?" not broadcast the darker moments, you know, and my response is always that it's hard and I want people to know it's hard. I mean, I, in my real life, I spend a lot of time saying, oh, we, we can do it, we're great, we're our spouses, we, we can handle anything, but it's rough, and sometimes I felt like I had um, not been as honest with my family readiness group because I was trying to be so optimistic that I wasn't letting them talk
story can I relate to the most? The opening story, um, the character Meg, I sort of think of her as being my fictional twin. She's a character who's always eavesdropping and listening through the thin walls of army housing, which is notoriously shabby and then people can usually hear at least something they shouldn't hear going on in their neighbor's house. Um, so this character, she's always listening and I kind of felt like that was my role as I was writing this book because I was listening and translating the stories into fiction the way she was listening and sort of imagining things that were going on in her neighbor's house. So, and that's, I think, one of the happy stories because she waits for her soldier and I'm still married to my husband, so I like her. She's one of the good ones.
Did it take to write the book? Yeah. It took about three years from when I started writing until it was published. So that might seem like a long time. Maybe it was eight stories, but for me, that was kind of fast work. I'm a pretty slow writer. Um, and I said, what was the second part of your question? Uh, what would you do differently? Did you add more stories? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I sometimes I think I might even make. When I was writing them, I was thinking very much of trying to make them mirror life on the base. And sometimes you run into someone at the commissary, then you don't see them for three months, and then you see them like every day. Or, you know, just this very random life. You're all in this kind of small world, like a very, very, very small town. But it's still a big place. It was for Fort Hood. So it felt like these stories, if I just had someone occasionally like crossing into another story, and then maybe they have a big role in one story, a little role in another. It felt very um, much like life on the military base. But now, I don't know, sometimes I think I should have had, I don't know, concentrated maybe on just a few characters and let them do more in the collection. But I don't know. I mean, a writer is always rewriting, I think, their own work. I'm never happy with it. So, good thing somebody just told me stop. Now I live in Fallsford, Virginia, and um, just until July, we moved to Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. Yeah, I kind of wish we stay in America for a little longer, but it, it'll maybe it'll be a new book, so that's my favorite. Okay. Uh, 
question is, it's easier to live on a military base than an off base when your soldiers get yeah. killed? If you have kids, absolutely. I think um, it's good to stay on the post and have, I mean, you have everything you need on a post. I don't know how familiar you guys are with military life, but they make a, a base, a place that you never leave, need to leave. So if you don't have a car, theoretically, you should be able to find everything you, you want. There's childcare, there's libraries, there's post offices, there's restaurants, there's just about everything. So, when your soldier's gone, it's really nice to have all of that right there. And you're in a community and everyone is going through the same thing. So, you know, they know what's going on with you, which is kind of nicer. I don't know. Sometimes I would go home to my family when my husband was deployed. And my family, of course, loved me more than anything else. My parents would stay with them. But they didn't quite get what it was like to not have my soldier there. And my sister, you know, I hang out with her and her husband. And they're awesome, but I was always aware, like, oh, my husband isn't here. And it's selfish, but it was almost easier to hang out with just all the chicks who are moping and gloomy because our soldiers are gone, but we're all in the same boat, and you have that community, and it just it feels good to be connected to those people who understand. Yes, ma'am. The question is, if I read a memoir, or? Oh, God. I don't know. I wouldn't let him. My goodness. <laughs> Jeez. Um, he, he's not really a rocket. I don't know. He, he writes, like, papers, nonfiction. I think he's a big military history buff, but I would not want him to write our story. I don't know. Don't give him any ideas. 